constructed. I mean, you already know this from lecture three. So, but how do you find the dynamic actuation space? You, you know how to link a single uh, twist in the freedom space at its speed with its wrench. So what, what you do is like you, um, I suggest starting with omega zero and plug in a bunch of twists in the freedom space and find their corresponding wrenches. Then plug in some random omega and, and do it again with a, with a couple other twists um, or the same ones in the, the freedom space and you get some other omega and just keep doing that and linearly combine them till you, it's, it's clear you filled out the dynamic actuation space. That's how you calculate the dyna dynamic actuation space. And this is the entire chart of dynamic and static actuation spaces except including wrenches and moments. Um, you know, I just showed you this, uh, the parallel pyramid with the blue things in it before with static actuation spaces. Um, but here's, here's everything with the orange and the black and everything. And this is the exact same as constraint space. It's just oriented differently, and, you know, or it's, it's just flipped because I, you know, I, I put a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 actuators, right? Okay, but, um, but here's, here's just the, the absolute crazy thing. So, so that's how I found this dynamic actuation space, and then it guides you how to pick them. And then you can use that same equation, it, you know, you, you can find out what magnitudes you need to do to get to actually push on this at, at whatever plane you actually want to push on um, to, to match the speed and everything. Um, and and so, so I've given you all the theory to, to both statically and dynamically load things. But here's the nutty thing. Okay, so turns out, like, you know, most people think, like, my goodness, it, you know, th this system achieves three degrees of freedom. So you'd think, well, of course you need three actuators. And that's right if you're quasi-statically loading it. But who would have thought if you're dynamically loading it, you actually need five? It's like, why five? You know, that's just weird. So, so it's, uh, dynamic actuation space is already very useful because if you actually want to drive something at an appreciable speed, um, you, it, you, it, it, might, it may surprise you to find you need more actuators than you have degrees of freedom. Okay, and then it tells you how to place them and all that stuff. And, and how to linearly combine them to, to, to get the, the motions in the freedom space you want with no parasitic error or minimal parasitic error. Um, and so that, that's very non-intuitive. The other interesting thing is, is what would happen, the reason the dynamic actuation space was different than the static actuation space, and the reason you needed more actuators in this dynamic actuation space than static actuation space, is because the centers of mass and the centers of stiffness of the system did not align, right? It began at the center of stiffness, went all the way down, then came up and settled on the center of mass. If the centers of stiffness and center of mass had been the same, then nothing would have had to move, and the static actuation space would have been the same as the dynamic actuation space. That's another really interesting thing. So, first of all, dynamic actuation space will always be the same or be more complex and have more actuators in it. It'll never get simpler. That's one principle, um, you know. But but the, the most important principle is, my goodness, if you just align your center of mass and center of stiffness in a design you design, um, you know, then then your actuation becomes much easier, and you just need as many actuators as you have degrees of freedom, and and it's much simpler to place, and they're much simpler to drive. So that's a really important takeaway: is if you're going to design this align your centers of mass with your center of stiffness. So one thing you could have done to be smart if you had to have this weird tabletop thing, right, is you, you could have cut a hole in the base and just kept extending the mass below it until the center of mass of the whole stage was halfway down the flexure length and, and they were right on top of each other. If you had done that, uh, if you had known the importance of that and lowered that center of mass to align it with the center of stiffness, you would have had um, just a, the static actuation space is just a single plane would have been the same as the dynamic actuation space. You would just need three actuators and you could drive the whole thing at any speed with no problem. Another thing to do is, is um, you know, this is a much simpler design than that with that big T-shaped thing and the wires and everything nonsense. Um, this, is, this is a much better design that's just nice and symmetric and obviously its center of stiffness is in the center. You don't even need to calculate. You see, there's three flexures. There's this one and then that one. That's a, that's a, um, a serial element 
there's a blade and there's a blade, serial element and there's three in parallel, so it's a hybrid system, um, you know, but uh, you can tell right off the bat the center of mass and the center of stiffness is all going to be at the same point in the center. And so its static actuation space is the same as its dynamic actuation space. Nothing will move and you'll always just need three actuators. So this is another reason, um, you know, to, so this is another way you can align mass and stiffness, or <laughs> center of mass and center of stiffness, okay? So very, very powerful concepts, okay? So some big takeaways, if you're going to design something, make sure once you've tried the topology, you at least look into what its static actuation space would be, make sure it's reasonable, and then try and align your center of mass and center of stiffness so that you don't have to deal with dynamic actuation space. You can just drive at any speed. If for whatever reason from constraints you can't align them or it's difficult to align them or you find they don't align, um, then, uh, you know, because it's tough to perfectly align them, then you'll need to deal with dynamic actuation space. You know how to calculate it. You'll find you might need more actuators than you have degrees of freedom. And you'll know how to, how to place them. Now, if you really need high precision, though, um, just know because of the transient part that doesn't, that takes a while to, um, to, to damp out, um, especially with flexures with low damping, um, you might find that actually you just always need <laughs> six actuators to, to really control everything nicely at many at different speeds. You know, dynamic actuation space is a nice approximation. It can save you money. So, you know, you don't go off and buy six actuators. In this, this case, uh, you just needed to buy five and save you an actuator and save you control and all this stuff. But um, in reality, when you consider the transient and actual damping and everything, Sometimes it's just easiest and worth it and, and best if you just always stick six independent actuators on it with sensors and use closed loop control and then, then you're going to make sure you're taken care of at any speed with closed loop control. So that, that's just a practical thing. So, um, okay, so let, let me introduce you to the final concept of this course. Um, which is flexures that decouple actuators, okay? So I, I've talked about how to know the, the kind, number, location, orientation of actuators, how to place them, um, how to drive them for force-based actuators, anyway, I've talked about at different speeds. Um, and, and, and so now we're going to talk about displacement-based actuators and, and how you might need to decouple them or they'll shear or break each other off, okay? Um, and so we're, we're really shifting gears here. And this is, these last things are very complicated, so I'm only going to talk about it kind of superficially, and then that's all you need to know, okay? Okay, so let me just introduce the concept of decouple flexures. You know, when I showed the transmission flexure from that one, uh, you know, lecture 10, um, I talked about, I introduced decoupling flexures. You know, that's microscopy stage. You want to move with your hand. You know, you've got your, your things that you want to twist with your hand. And, um, and you want your stage to, uh, you know, y y y you, want, you want them to be decoupled. So when you rotate one, it doesn't affect the other. When you rotate the other one, it doesn't affect the other. And, and the outputs are decoupled. They, they don't affect each other. Um, that, that's the dream, right? And, but that takes some sophisticated flexure synthesis. And, I, you know, you saw how I did that, but I kind of waved my hands in that example. Um, but, but there is a systematic way using fact to sweep through the space and consider all of them uh, simultaneously. Okay, and so um, first of all, just the concept, this is a, a flexure that achieves tip and tilt, okay? But obviously, if you just attached a thing on here and rotated it, it would shear off. You know, if you had two rotary motors, that were displacement-based motors, and they just they just rotated in two directions. You stuck it directly on something that was um, constrained to achieve tip and tilt. Um, then, when you tipped one, it would shear off the other and break it. And so, you obviously need some intermediate uh, flexures to decouple these, so that when you rotate this, this one doesn't move. It certainly doesn't shear and break off as this bends down. And then, when this moves, this doesn't shear or break off when this moves down. So, you need some flexures in between that can stiffly pass the rotation of this through, but then deform these flexures to accommodate the deformation and vice versa on the other one. So these actually, this one doesn't affect this one, 
this one doesn't affect this one, and they're both independently can get independent outputs. Okay, those are purely decoupled flexures, and it's awesome. And the theory to to to, to um, design them uses actuation space and all of uh, facts most complex concepts. So it's it's actually extremely difficult to teach. Um, I actually tried to teach this. <laughs> I had a 15-minute uh, conference presentation at ASPE where I had to teach. No one knew what fact was, so I had to teach what fact is and teach how to synthesize decoupled flexures in 15 minutes. <laughs> and I, I, I attempted it, and I, you know, I think I got through 150 slides in 15 minutes, and uh, and everyone was looking at me like I was absolutely insane. So. Um, it was <laughs> really embarrassing. So, you know, I, I, I don't even bother even trying to teach it in this class with all your knowledge because it's just, it's a little over people's heads. If you are <laughs> curious, though, I have the slides and um, you can read a paper on it. And it's, you know, at your level, it's not that hard to understand, okay? But there is a systematic way to go through all the designs so you can consider all the ways to decouple your actuators, okay? Okay, so let's let's look at um, a you know this this famous PI flexure stage, um, right? Um, that uh, has these bent blade flexures that connect to ground to the stage, and it's got these piezo actuators that are you know there's, it says three degrees of freedom as you can see here, two translations rotation, and so they 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 very wisely you know this is a great flexure design, it's a great actuation space design. Um, the center of mass and center of stiffness are directly aligned, so the dynamic and static actuation space are the same. You just need three actuators. They, they align them the best they could, or the best that could be done um, uh, to make them independent. And so it's a great design, and they sell this as a nano positioner. But problem is, is the actuators aren't decoupled. They can get away with this because they're just moving nanometers, you know. So, it, like, but, but it, say you were moving a large range with this design. Say you put, like, a lead screw in here or, or something. You know, they put piezos in there that you, you give a voltage and they expand. That's a, that's a displacement-based actuator, right? Um, you give it a voltage, it expands a certain distance. But you don't know the force it's pushing. You know the displacement, right? So, imagine, imagine you, you had, like, a lead screw that you just... You, you just absolutely jammed this to push it. Well, it would be directly, since they're all directly connected to it, they're displacement-based actuators, direct contact. As you displace in this direction, you would be shearing, breaking those other ones. And, and depending on how far you pushed it, it would start arcing and affecting the other ones. So they'd be all, it'd be tough to control and you'll, you're going to break your actuators. Okay, they get away with it because, like I said, they're just doing nanometer position, so they're not stressing their actuator as much at all, and it works great, you know. Um, okay, but, but again, um, they're not decoupled at all. If you want any appreciable range um, beyond nanometers, you're going to break your actuators, and, and, and they're going to be coupled very quickly. Okay, so... Um, here is one way you could decouple actuators. It's a really dumb way to do it. You'll see a lot of people doing this. You're, you basically stack stages. So it's like if you want your three degrees of freedom, so these are the three degrees of freedom we want, say, X, Y, translations, and Z, rotation. Okay. Well, someone could say, well, like, let's, let's, uh, let's do this first stage with the actuator that gets a translation. Then let's do the second stage with an actuator that gets this translation. Then let's do the third stage with an actuator that gets this rotation. So we're basically stacking things in series and independently um, actuating them. You know, and, that, and it's very decoupled, right? So this actuator just affects that translation. This actuator just affects that translation. This actuator just affects that rotation. So they're nicely decoupled. They're certainly not going to break each other. They're not going to shear each other, so they're decoupled. Um, they, 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 their outputs are not entirely decoupled, though, because um, just because we didn't make it symmetric, remember that this one will actually arc. So depending on how far you push this and it arcs, it might start affecting how far this moves. You know, like if, if this wasn't moved and you move this way five millimeters or whatever, um, versus if this was pushed up five millimeters and it's pulled back one millimeter that direction, then you need to push the six millimeters to get it to the same spot. So they do start affecting each other because we didn't make them symmetric. Um, this one's completely independent, though. But if we had made these flexures symmetric, 
uh, then, okay, then you could have purely decoupled them. So not only do they not shear and break each other as they move, but uh, they don't affect each other's output at all, and they're, they're purely decoupled. So this is one way to do it, but like I said, it's dumb. And let me tell you why it's dumb. First of all, um, uh, you've got actuators moving. Okay, so this actuator doesn't move. Its cords can just come off here. But this actuator, its cords are like moving with it. You know, and so is this one. And then, you know, and, and so it's like you're actually moving the actuator. So you're, 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 you're having to move the mass of the actuator and all its cords are getting moved, which can tangle and be a mess and, and, and can start contacting and rubbing the system in bad ways and stuff. So it, it's, it's generally preferable, you know, with this design, uh, the ground, the actuators were all mounted to the ground. As they actuated the stage, none of them moved. You don't have to consider the mass of the actuators in, in the mass matrix of the stage. And the, the, co the, the, the wires coming from the actuators could be nicely bundled and they would never move because the actuators don't move. Okay, so reason number one this is dumb is you have moving actuators and you have to consider their mass. Reason number two, it's totally dynamically not balanced. This actuator has to move everything, including the actuators, whereas this one just moves this one and this actuator, and this one just moves this tiny mass with this. So it's like... Some actuators are having to work way harder than others, and it's not dynamically balanced. And it's just, it's just a cheap, lazy way to do it. It's just to decouple all the degrees of freedom and stack them. So it's, not, it's a way to do it, but it's not a good way to do it. Okay, here is a great way to do it. This is the best way you can do it with flexures. Okay? And not, I'm not saying this is the best design, but this is the best approach. Okay, this, this, this design demonstrates an approach, okay? So you can see here um, that there's just three actuators. Here's the stage you care about. It gets three translations, rotation we want, and it's just got three actuators, okay? It's center of mass, it's center of stiffness, they're all centered, everything's great. Um, it, it just needs three actuators. And those actuators, the ground is this outer thing. Those actuators are stuck and mounted to the ground, so they're not moving, right? Um, and their, their cords aren't moving but they're able to drive the stage and not shear each other. So you can see as this one moves, this one's not moving at all, so it's not going to break it or shear it uh, for the other two. And this, of course, it's going to be the same for the other ones. And yet its output is largely independent. When I drive this, the stage is basically rotating around this line. And, and it would be the same for all of them. Um, so by changing the magnitude of these, you can get the... So, you know, of course, this one will get a rotation there, two will get a rotation out here, three will get a rotation out here, right? But if you, if you combine them with different magnitudes, one to one to one, you get the rotation. And if you combine them with two, negative one, negative one, you get the x. And you do zero, one, negative one, and you get the y. And then you can get any other combination in that freedom space with minimal or no parasitic error. So this is such a better approach because it, it allows displacement-based actuators they don't have to move. The cords don't move. Um, they can go large ranges without anything breaking each other or jamming each other. Um, you're moving as little mass as possible, which means your natural frequency is going to be great. You can drive it at high speeds. And, um, and the actuator outputs are independent, so it's like um, uh, it makes it a dream to, to control, right? So, like, decoupled actuators are a really good idea, okay? So... Um, so, okay, so now we get into, well, how, how do you design these? Well, it, it's, it's useful, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because designing these, like I said, is very, very difficult, okay? Um, and by the way, um, this, this first thing I ever showed here, this uses that same approach. It's, you know, notice the actuators don't have to move. They can be mounted on something, and you just independently do it, and they independently drive this. You could take your hand and independently rotate these, and you wouldn't feel any influence from these, but this could, like, tip and tilt in all kinds of wacky ways. Okay, so it's a good approach to use this. So let, let's first define the different parts of these kind of mechanisms so to, to give you a sense for how you could design them, okay? So you could either add flexor bearings like this. This is a flexor bearing, okay? There's the ground, that's a serial element, and we use three of them. So these three are serial elements. They actually just independently constrain the stage so that they do the job of the bearings of constraining the providing constraining flexure so that the motions you don't want aren't there but the motions you do want the, the two translations and one rotation it is allowed okay 
So you could either have independent flexures that act as the job of the bearings, and then have another set of flexures that don't constrain anything. They have no constraint. So imagine you take this blue uh, actuator out. By the time you look at the freedom space from this ground to this stage, and then from this thing to this, and then from this to this, this is a zero degree of, or sorry, this is a six degree of freedom system. It has no constraints. Order of constraint is zero. So if you took these blue things out and just looked at this, so, so for instance, if you, if, you, if you took those all away, this would be nicely constrained to achieve the, th the two translations and one rotation, as shown here. Okay, they're just doing the independent job of doing that. Okay? If I took those away, though, and took the blue ones out, each of these things is doing nothing. This would have six degrees of freedom. They're, therefore, they're not doing the job. So this design is good because those flexures are independently doing the job of guiding the bearings. And then these guys are independently doing the, They don't provide any constraint, but they do the job of decoupling the flexures. Okay? So like I said, without those, it's six degrees of freedom. Okay, um, this is called a, f so the, the decoupling flexures can be bro serial actuation chains. They're broken into two different parts, okay? There's a flexure coupling that basically interfaces between the ground and some stage that like, um, that the actuator directly pushes between. And what that does is it makes sure that actuator doesn't experience transverse har harmful loads. It just, if this is a linear actuator that's just, translates straight, then these flexure bearings are just going to make sure this block just translates straight. That if there's weird forces or torques put on this block, that the, the flexures take it up, not the actuator. So they don't shear or break the actuator. So this is the flexure coupling, okay, here. Um, and then on top of that flexure coupling comes the decoupling flexure from there to there, which is shown here, okay. That flexure does the job of stiffly passing the linear force through it onto the stage, but while absorbing or deforming uh, uh, the motions caused by the other two actuators. So that's what a decoupling flexor does, is it passes the force of the intended actuator through to the stage, but it absorbs through deformation the motion of the stage caused by the other actuators. Okay, And when you stick it on in series with the flexor coupling, it makes a serial Let's see here. It makes a serial actuation chain. So the whole thing's called a serial actuation chain. It consists of decoupling flexures and flexure coupling. They each have their two independent jobs, but together they, 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 they are a serial actuation chain, okay? And then there's also the flexure bearing. So, so there's, there's two ways you could do it. Um, you could do what this design does, which is have all the bearing constraint stuff done by the flexure bearings, and then have these guys provide no constraint, but just do the decoupling of the flexures. Another way you could do it though, that's really tricky, is you could have no flexure bearings and you could design it so that your serial actuation chains not only do the job of decoupling their actuators, but they also do the job of constraining the stage simultaneously. And, and so, so for instance, you, you see, um, this just has this element repeated six times. This guy, um, allows the actuators to be decoupled. So as you, as you drive them with the, the motions, you want the X, Y, and Z rotation. Um, you can see that the actuators don't move. They're all decoupled. Everything's nice. But there's also no other flexure bearings to constrain those motions. These do that job as well. Okay, so, and you can do every combination between. You can do like half the constraint with flexure bearings and the other half with serial actuation chains that decouple. Um, you could do it all in the serial actuation chains. You can do none in the serial actuation chains. So you can see there's a lot of different options. And I came with a systematic approach to be able to go through them all. So in this case, there is the flexure coupling, okay, and this simple blade was the decoupling flexor. And together, they're the serial actuation chain, and they're the system's flexure bearings in this design. Okay, so the rest of this, using fact analyze decoupling system. So, this section goes through how to comb through all the freedom and actuation uh, constraint spaces and actuation spaces so you can analyze how this would work. Um, and then the next section I talk about, this, I, I reverse it and say, you know, here's all the systematic approaches to go through all of them to 
constraint, you know, constrained stages with the correct actuation space, you know, with flexure bearings that get some order of constraint, and then to design serial actuation chains that have decoupling flexures that work that do some con some of the other constraint or either or, right? So, so you can go through all the different uh, ways. Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna zip through this because it's just way too confusing. That there is one thing I want to point out that's important. Okay. Um, Okay, let me just get through here. Uh, you can look through these. These will make a lot more sense if you read my paper on this. The, the paper is actually pretty good. It's published in Precision Engineering. So here's the important thing when you're picking decoupling flexures. So in this design, it's just the blade that interfaces the flexure coupling here with the stage. And this whole thing, you know, with all of them together, constrain it so it gets the motions you want, right? But how do you pick these? Well, it's important that, you know, this actually puts a force through there, so it's got to not have a degree of freedom in this direction. You can see it doesn't have a, re a, a black arrow. Okay, so it'll pass that to the stage. But then notice, if I drive this stage with actuator 2, it'll rotate around a line here. If I drive it with actuator 3, it'll rotate around a line here. What's important is that these two motions, freedom spaces, caused by the actuation of the other two actuators, the system lie within the actuation or the freedom space of that decoupling flexure, which in this case is just a red plane. You can see this clearly lies in the red plane, this clearly lies in the red plane, and therefore this is a good decoupling flexure so that when you drive this, as the stage rotates around this axis, it will be taken up by the deformations within the compliant space of this decoupling flexure for both of them but it'll stiffly pass it through. That's like a key concept to, to, to understand. And then the rest you could probably figure out the systematic rules. Um, but go see my paper. Uh, this is the general synthesis approach. Okay, so here's, here's I mean, this is a cool mechanism that gets, here's another way you get it, the two translations decoupled and the rotation, okay. So I, I designed a bunch of different examples using the systematic approach so you can go down all the different options and see them all. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, let's see if there's anything else worth saying here. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, we built it and we tested it and we got some data and it, it works and everything. So, so, but... Um, Anyway, that's, that's pretty much the last lecture of the course. Again, you don't need to understand how to design decoupled flexures, although you might find them useful in your project, and so it might be worth reading that paper or coming and asking me about it, or just ripping them from, from the, these slides, uh, you know, using... So what, what you definitely can do is just design the flexure bearings to guide the motions you want right, and then just use those serial actuation chains that I initially showed you that get that add no constraint themselves so they won't interfere with the flexure bearings but they will decouple any motion um, that, that you'd like so so you can just rip that one um, th when I first introduced serial actuation chains just use that um, or, or something like it right um, okay so but with that um, you should be pretty knowledgeable about actuating flexures how to how to pick them, how to locate them, how to orient them, whether they're force-based, displacement-based, um, and how to decouple them and, and get some really neat things. Um, and then sensing, you know, uh, strain gauges you can attach onto flexures that deform and you can use strain gauges or great sen precision sensors or you can use cap probes that measure the capacitance of the stage and put those as close to the thing you're measuring as possible and they can measure things. Um, yeah, you can use visual systems that have really high resolution cameras to, to, to measure things. So there's different ways to sense flexures and then of course you can close the loop and control them. So, um, but the class doesn't focus much on sensing. Um, I, I, I did, <laughs> I almost came up with something called sensing space and then my acronym would have gone to fax with an S on the end, uh, but that didn't seem to work out so well. <laughs> so, but anyway, that, that's a fact in a nutshell. Hopefully you enjoyed the course. Uh, good luck on your project and uh, the practice homeworks and the exams. Um, and, uh, and, and stay tuned uh, for, uh, you know, check out my YouTube channel as I post stuff. You'll, you'll obviously notice I have a lot of extra stuff in that channel that I don't talk about in this class. And I tend to do a follow-on class, 294B, 
uh, that uh, teaches how to do interconnected hybrid systems and, and, and that kind of thing in the context of designing metamaterials and architected materials. Um, and, and so that, that class is in, in the works. I'm not sure when that will be ready. But thanks for taking the class um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll uh, hopefully uh, stay in touch. Take care.